Well, thanks for being here today. Uh, if you're a guest, I do want you to know that um, we, we do have a church that meets every Sunday. Most of them are on 30A right now. Um, I will tell you, of all the churches I've ever pastored, this is the travelingest church I have ever seen in my life. It's, uh, it's awesome. I mean, hey, do it, man. Uh, in fact, we were joking this morning, maybe next year we need to have this service. They, you know, they, I don't know if you're, if, you're, if you're new to Franklin, they call 30A uh, Williamson County South. And uh, it's really funny because that's exactly where we're headed tomorrow. So, um, you know, it's one of those places that, uh, so all of you watching from 30A, it was funny, Shane, Shane mentioned this morning, he's like, did you notice how like yesterday, like, and even like, I, I even noticed on Friday evening, on Friday evening, the roads, everybody was trying to get out to get to I-65. And yesterday it was like, a, it felt like Franklin 20 years ago when we moved here. Like there was nobody, it was awesome. There was nobody here. You could actually get to Kroger, you know, and it didn't take 30 minutes just to get there. Um, so anyway, but, uh, for, but hey, let's, talk, let's don't tell anybody else, but the really godly people are here today, okay? The, the really Christ, shh, don't, don't tell them. All right. Um, <laughs> um, all right, man. Well, uh, today we're going to keep going in our foundations for freedom, for freedom cla uh, class, we're, uh, sermon. What's this thing called? A sermon. Uh, we're going to keep going in this series is the word I'm looking for. And today I'm going to talk to you specifically about meeting with God. Say, so what, what do you mean, Jason? Meeting with God. We do, we've been talking about, we went through seven weeks of Keys to Freedom, and there are still lots of stories coming out of that. And God's been doing a really unique work in that regard. We, we hear a lot of stories coming out. But I told you I wanted to move us from keys to freedom to actual practical extensions. of. We, we know that the Lord Jesus told us it was for free. In Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ set us free, Paul said. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Right. So what is freedom? It is the ability to navigate this life knowing not just what we are, but whose we are, right? You got to know whose you are. You got to know who owns you. You got to know who owns your narrative. You got to know, and we're going to talk about that today in a very powerful story with a man that I connect with big time in the Bible. Um, and, and the reason that meeting with God is so important to your spiritual freedom, it is because, it is because that You've got to know what it means to be filled up with God to execute your Christian life. There is a filling if you're willing. That's my rhyme for today, right? There is a filling if you're willing. And, and, and I tell you that because God, God, is, God is never, listen to me, church, God is never going to do more through you than he's first done in you, okay? He's going to do it in you before he does it through you. And he is far more concerned about you becoming Christ-like than he is for anything else you can do for him. And then be really honest with you, I get that twisted up a lot of times. I, I, I am an achiever. Uh, I have an, if you, um, if you, if I took, my Enneagram was the achiever. My disc profile is the high I, um, which is the, uh, the, the, the I means influencer, and it, it means that's translated hyper person who likes to does a lot, who likes to do a lot of stuff, you know, and, and that's me. I, I enjoy getting in there and, and pushing things forward. And I have to realize all the time, uh, the Lord has been trying to teach me now for literally over 30 years that, um, he appreciates all that I do, but I, I, I don't have to do it to earn his pleasure. My running joke uh, when I talk to leaders is if God had a refrigerator, I would always be coloring pictures and say, hey, you like this one? You want to put that on there? You know, I did this for you, you know, kind of thing. And that's just a, a blessing and a curse at the same time. And so I want to talk to you today about what it means to meet with God because God wants to meet with you. We're going to go to 1 Kings 19 is where we're going to go. 1 Kings chapter 19. And we're going to talk about this guy named Elijah. And this is a, a guy that actually, when I came to Clearview, and in in in, uh, in the year 2017, the Lord began to specifically in October of 2017, uh, God began to reveal to me things about truths about Elijah's life that were going to be true to me here, and and that has played out to be very real in my life and. 
And so uh, this man is a man I've studied a lot, and I've got a lot more I don't know about him. But we're going to talk about this man, Elijah. So let me give you a little context, all of you over in the chapel. Uh, so glad you're here. Um, for those of you that, um, hey, you know what? One thing I was thinking of as I'm just thinking about all the folks over in the chapel, we had to walk down the, the when you got here today, there was caution roped off and all the ice. And, you know, when you got, look, man, in a post-COVID world, when you got live stream, and then you got cold weather, Baptists don't play, okay? They ain't coming out for that. So, so just one thing I was really excited about with, with Vicky and all of our facilities group, did y'all notice how they had all that stuff roped off? Hey, let's give them a hand and just say thank you for that. Because you know, if you've ever fallen on ice, it ain't fun. Right, and it hurts a lot, and there's sometimes doctor bills that come after that. I think the forethought of we, yeah, I've been here for a number of years, and I was like, how cool that they thought to go and mark off those spots with caution tape. I don't know, that was pretty. I, I appreciated that pretty much. So we're going to read about Elijah. Here's the context. So Elijah has just called down fire from heaven. Okay, now you would think that that would be. Like, you would think he would be John Wayne, right? Wyatt Earp, Michael Jordan, Kobe LeBron, Derek Jeter, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, all rolled into one, right? Like, you would think his confidence level would be unbelievable. He literally, never happened to me before, hey, God, do it. And then whammo, here comes all the lightning and they just consumes the prophets. It's the showdown. It's the wild west of this battle and confrontation where Elijah is saying, hey, in, li in fact, Elijah just didn't tell all the people uh, at, at the mountain that day at Carmel. He didn't just tell all the non-believers. He told the believers to choose. If you go back and read the story, he said, you need to choose who you're going to follow because they've been kind of doing a little bit of both. So... Elijah calls down fire from heaven. They kill all these prophets. And then here we go. Ready? We're picking it up in chapter 19. We're going to pick it up in um, verse 1. Now, Ahab, Ahab is the, uh, he is the, the, the husband of a lady named Jezebel. And Jezebel is a prophetess. She is uh, literally an instrument of the devil. And it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all of her prophets. She was, a, she was the head of the false prophets with the sword. Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. And she says, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as one of, one of them by tomorrow about this time. Translation, I'm going to kill you. That's exactly what she said. I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. You've got 24 hours to live. And it says Elijah was afraid, and he arose, and he ran for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He went by himself. And he came, and he sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. Now, this isn't suicide. No, he's literally saying, God, I just want to die. I just want to die. And he said, it's enough now. Take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. There's, there's a lie in that right there. Number five. And he, lay, and he laid down and he slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said, arise and eat. And Elijah looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones, and a jar of water. And so he ate and he drank and he laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and, and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So a second time he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and for 40 nights at Horeb, the mountain of God. Now here's where the story gets interesting. If it wasn't already, verse 9. And then he, they, he came there to a cave and he lodged. So now, he, now, he's, now he's gone off into a cave, right? That's a, that's a big part of this story. He's running for his life. He's hiding in a cave. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I've been, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And they seek to take my life and take it away. 
And here's the verse 11. This is a big part right here. Ready? So God said to Elijah, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rendering the mountains and breaking it into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after a fire, the sound of gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out, and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts. The sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek to take my life and take it away. And the Lord said to him, verse 15, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel, king over Aram. And he goes in to give him all kinds of different directions. And then in verse 18, he tells him, And yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And the story keeps going on there for a while, but we're going to stop in verse 18. You know, here's the reality. The reality is that no Christian is immune from dark places. No Christian is immune from depression. No Christian is immune from anxiety. That, that, listen, those are not indicators of your spiritual life at all. They're not. Everybody goes through seasons like that. Okay, and, uh, and it's really fascinating that Elijah, what always strikes me about this story is not only did he go through it, it's, it's when he went through it. I mean, on the heels of this huge victory, it's really, it's really fascinating to me about how that happens. And so you have to learn how to, to, to be filled with God because there is a filling if you're willing, if you're willing to get it and you're willing to meet. And so the, the what, reason I, I pointed this out is it's what, it's what God told him in verse 11. He said, go stand on the mountain. Go stand on the mountain. That was a meeting place that was designed for him and Elijah. See, if you, if, you, if you do not have designated places that you meet with God and I'm, or a designated routine, and by routine, I don't mean 7 o'clock every morning. My routine changes all the time. But if you do not have meeting places with God, then I'm going to tell you you're going to suffer from it. You're going to suffer in your decision-making life. This whole story is a story of an unraveling. I mean, things begin to just tank. The Titanic began to happen in his mind, in his soul, all these things. And what did God say? Go stand before me. You're in a cave. You ever been in a cave? I've been in a cave literally before once. That was dumb. Not going to do that anymore when you turn on your headlamp and you see all kinds of eyes of different shapes. You're thinking, you know, I don't have to be here. And so I chose never to be there again, right? You ever been in a cave in your soul? I have many times. You ever done that? You got to learn to stand before the Lord because that's where freedom continues. You see, let me tell you something. The reason that meeting with God, listen to me, friends, the reason that meeting with God matters so much is because you cannot carry out your purpose in life you can't execute your calling in life. You, 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 you can't be filled with the Spirit, ongoingly speaking, if you do not meet with the Spirit giver. You just can't. You're going to end up sabotaging so much of your life. And I can tell you what's going to end up happening to you is you'll start making decisions on your own. You hear me? See, we call that carnality. To be a carnal person means not that you're into debauchery. It can mean that. Let me tell you what the definition of carnality really is. It's attempting to do supernatural activity in natural power. You begin to become your own God. You begin to make your own decisions. You begin to actually go down the road of what you think is best. And that's what Elijah did. What Elijah did is he took his life into his own hands. He departed 
from his calling because he got really depressed and he got really, he got really twisted up in his head. And so the reason I want you to avoid that is I believe that God is going to use us in this church. To, to, he is already using us to do really unique things and really unique things in missions in the local community. The Lord has been doing a work through our whole Keys to Freedom study. We've seen people experiencing the power of Jesus in ways that some of them haven't maybe ever. God is shaping and cleansing our own body. But I can tell you, we have to learn now, we have to learn now to meet with God and get the filling because there is a filling if you're willing. There is. There is a filling if you're willing to get it. And, and, and it, it impacts all of your life because if you take your life into your own hands, you're going to break things. You're going to break things. In fact, the way I would say it to you, I made this up this morning. You ready? Carnal Christians create collateral damage. Say that real fast. It's hard. I tried. Carnal Christians create collateral damage. When, when, you, when you start doing things the way you want to do them, when you start walking out from the umbrella of, of what God has told you to do, when you start doing things that are contradictory to this word, you're going to break stuff. People, listen, listen to me, friends. Jesus, Jesus didn't just come to just save you from the fires of hell, which he did. He didn't just come to get you into a baptistry, which he did. But if that was the end game of Christianity, then really the New Testament would be like one verse. Repent and be baptized. I mean, that's it. No, Jesus came to give us life. He left us here to be his witnesses. He left us here to bring his glory to there. But if we do not sit underneath those meeting places with God. So I think it's fascinating that when Elijah was going through a dark time, and you will go through many, you will go through many, 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 many in your Christian life. They'll look different in your work, your family, your own soul. You'll go through them with your church. You'll go through them with your kids. You'll go through them all the time. And you'll go through these mental battles. And you've got to know that the meeting place to go stand on the mountain. Some of the best advice I ever received from coaches over my life, stay close to God. That's on me to do. Stay close to God. See, I, I, and I, now is this passage, listen, is this, is this passage, um, is this about meeting with God? No. Is, is chapter 19 about your own personal prayer life? No, it's not. But you've heard me tell you over and over and over again, if we're going to apply this to freedom, um, you, you've told me, yeah, you, you've, you've, you've heard me tell you before that, that you can look at the Bible characters and you can learn from them. You can look at patterns of their life. And that's what we're doing right now. We're looking at a pattern, actually a bad one, you can look at men. Elijah was a man of God. Nobody questions that. But there was something that he was doing that was out of round. There was something he was doing that out of whack. And so you can study men and women in the Bible, and you can learn things. I, I, I'm telling you, I do this all over my life. I, there's many people I will watch, and I will evaluate, and I look for patterns all the time. You can look for the really great things, and you can learn from them. You know, really great people do that. People that I've learned and watched over the years that became great in their craft. I'm not talking about great with money. Great in their craft. They learned from the best. They learned. I'll give you a perfect example. Kobe Bryant. That's a kind of a historic picture with Kobe and Michael Jordan. Because you know what Kobe Bryant's doing in a game? He's asking Michael Jordan for advice. He, in, in, that, in that moment, you got the greatest basketball player to have ever played the game and a, and a, a kid who he, who, who he considered Michael Jordan his mentor, and he would call, he, he, somebody asked him if they were really close friends one time, and Kobe said, well, he did. And he said, ah, he was more like a big brother. We fought sometimes. We were really close. He said, I, I called him all the time. I even heard Michael Jordan talk about how he would text him at like 2 in the morning, like technical questions. Like, it is 2 in the morning. Why are you doing this? 
But in that particular picture, he, he, was, he asked him, he said, how do you feel the defense? And in that particular moment, he told him, he said, learn to feel the defense with your legs. And he's doing that in a game. He saw it. He was learning, he was learning patterns And he said, I put that into my life. You saw in the business world, there's a man named Jim Collins. Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great. This is a picture of Collins right here. Um, That's Jim Collins. He's a PhD researcher at University of Southern California. And he wrote How the Mighty Fall, which is, oh, How the Mighty Fall is a great book. Um, Good to Great is one of the greatest marketplace books ever written. And in that book, what was interesting about what Collins did, I love, it's fascinating. And if you're not into that stuff, you don't have to read it, but I'll tell you what he did. He, he took, like, I'll give you a hypothetical example. He took, like, Kroger and Publix, and he said, okay, they both sell tissue paper, soap, meat, soda, dental floss. They sell the same stuff. Why is one company leaps and bounds above the other one? So good to great is a comparison of marketplaces and companies that somehow just performed different. You know what he was looking for? Trends. He was looking for trends of greatness. Well, that's what we're doing this morning. We're looking at something this guy did and didn't do to learn about why the meeting place matters. So let's move into it. That's what we're doing. We're looking at why the meeting place matters. And the first key truth I would share with you is that God is a God of experienced truth. If you're going to lift something out of 1 Kings 19, lift that out. God is a God of experienced truth. And here's what I mean by that. Now, be very careful. I I didn't say he's just a God to be experienced. I don't want you to hear me say that um, we're elevating experience. You know, you got the word of God, right? We're not elevating experience above that. That can get really whacked out, okay? I mean, seriously, that can get really messed up. But at the same time, there are portions of denominations that want to have no experience ever and they just want to read this. And I'm telling you, before there was a written word, there was a living word. Before there was ever a papyrus on, pa- on words on paper, there was a living God. When you read the Old Testament, God was a God to be experienced. He met Moses, how? In a bush that was burning, but yet not really. Right? He went to Pharaoh and he said, Let my people go. He said, No. He said, Like frogs? Because you're going to get a lot of them. Like locusts? Get ready. All throughout, from the beginning to end, we see a God that was meant to be met with. He was meant to be met with. And so the meeting place matters. And so I, will, I, I tell you that because when God told Elijah to go stand on the mountain, he had a reason for it. He had to get him away from his circumstances, and he had to get him into a place where he could hear from him. Jesus said something in John 14 that's always stuck with me. Look at this. Jesus said about the Holy Spirit that he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth, The world cannot receive him. So in other words, the Holy Spirit's just reserved for believers because the world isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you, as the believers, you know him because he lives with you and later will be in you. It's that word with and in that hit me as I began to break down John 14 and looking at the attributes of what the Holy Spirit actually does. And what the Holy Spirit does is he, li- he now inhabits as a believer Christ in me. He is now inhabiting in me. He's, he's with me this way and he's in me here. So the place that God is is he inhabits who I am. And, be- and that's why you hear me talk so much all the time about the soul. Because your soul, your mind, your heart, your will, your emotions, that's the meeting places. God dwells inside of you, Christ in you. So you have to learn how to to, to decipher his voice. And you have to learn how to recognize his voice. You have to, if you want to hear from God, friend, and you can hear from God. You can hear from God. Because you hear from God, but listen, where he meets with you. and, And I've went round and round with God to no success rate whatsoever about this about 
many times about, you know, you made us in your image and you made us to be talking people. So I took that literal, so I talk a lot. And you made us to be talking people, but yet I don't get to hear you audibly. I don't appreciate that at all. To which he said nothing. <laughs> That's a pretty good joke. For, for all, that was kind of Fraser humor. Remember Fraser? It's kind of Fraser humor. Um, yeah. But I had to learn that God deals with me how he wants to deal with me. And he, dealt, he deals with me the way he wants to do it and the way he chose to do it is to give me a Holy Spirit to guide me and work in his word. Now, the word is the chief. That's the place. If you want to hear from God, you start right here. That's the number one way, right there. Boom. Okay? He never does anything outside his word. But the Holy Spirit is with me and he's in me. And so in those meeting places, those meeting places matter. And if you, why am I bringing all this up? If you want freedom in Christ, freedom is not a one-time thing. It's not just Jesus delivered you from all your sins. Jesus keeps delivering you. He continually delivers you to grow in Christ's likeness and to grow. So how does he do that? He does it. You cannot, would you ever expect to have a good marriage and never speak? Like literally never speak. What about if you have kids? Would you consider it good parenting to physically never talk? You have to meet, right? You have to meet. And so we're going to talk about the meeting place for just a second and why it's, it's so mission critical to your perpetual freedom. The first truth I would say to you is that in your meeting place, God sheds light on your current situation. This is why it matters. God sheds light on your current situation. Say, so what do you mean by that, Jason? Well, <laughs> Think about what happened in the cave with Elijah, right? God is the light, right? We agree with that. Jesus is the light. But in the cave, you got to create the light, right? See, notice, did you notice that God asked him there in those verses where, what are you doing here? And it wasn't, what are you doing here? So why are you here? Why are you in a cave? You left everybody. You left your servants back there. You isolated yourself. What are you doing here? Because that's what we do, right? When things don't go well, we tend to live in our head. You ever live in your head? I've been up in there. It's not fun. Pull yourself back. Get all up in your head. That's what he was doing. See, when, you're, when you pull back into the cave and you create your, that own cave experience, you got to create the light. No, we were meant to shine the light, not create it. Amen? We were meant to shine the light, not create it. So it, on the mountain, in the meeting, so we're just going to use mountain for metaf metaphorically for the meeting place. On the mountain, you know what you get? You get revealed truth. You get, you get all of this light that God shows to your whole situation. And so... On the mountain, you get the full picture. You get the full picture of all that God is doing. When you're in the cave, you know what you get? All you get is you. You just see yourself. You start listening to all the voices. Did you notice something about the cave experience? This is why the meeting place matters, y'all. In the meeting place, God sheds light on your current situation. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is with you. That's present tense and in you. He doesn't just fill you one time. As Baptists, we are genuinely, genuinely, historically fearful of the Holy Spirit because we're afraid that if we give ourselves into him, it's going to become a circus, and it won't. Why would you be afraid of God? Jesus, Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three. Why would you be afraid of the power source? The devil taught you to do that. Did you hear me, church? The devil taught you to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. And so Baptists aren't just the only ones guilty of it. Mainline denominations forever, I think, have been, have been taught to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. And I just chose not to be a long time ago. And I found, in light of 
contradicting myself a minute ago, I have found that there were a whole lot more Baptist preachers that believed in it and they were just afraid to talk about it because you tended to lose your job. I'm not joking. So I found that the Holy Spirit is with me and he's in me and he gave me the ability to interpret real-time situations Real-time situations. But you don't get that outside the meeting place. Because if you notice what happened in the meeting place, something unique happens here. I want you to look in verse... Verse 10. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel... They have, the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They killed your prophets, and I alone am left. Okay? There's some lies that Elijah's believing right there. Okay? But did you notice that in the cave, the lie became the truth? Did you notice that? See, in the cave, the lie becomes the truth because when you pull back into the cave, you, you have to create the light. And so what it began to, here was the first lie. This was the first lie that he believed. It was when Jezebel came to him and said, I'm going to kill you. You know, in order for a lie to work, what has to happen? You have to believe it a little, right? In or, you heard that in the agreements workshop. I went, off, I went into deep moments on that. In order for a lie to work, you have to believe it a little. And so what did he give to Jezebel? What he gave to Jezebel was basically, let's imagine for a minute that this Bible is a key, an actual key, like to your vehicle. He, he, so she says, I'm going to take your life. And he says, oh, okay, maybe you can. No, who is the decider of who lives and dies? God. God's the decider of that, right? So what I would have said to Jezebel is, look, woman. I mean, did y'all not get that? That was like, that was, that was not true. Like, you would think he would say, let's go. Did you see what I did yesterday? I'll burn everybody down. You would think this guy would have this John Wayne mentality, but he freaked out. He gave to Jezebel power she didn't have. In order for a lie to work, you have to believe it a little. So when you go out of the cave in, and onto the mountain, you begin to see, no, Elijah, she can't kill you. Not unless I let her, but I got a letter, and you forgot that. Here's another lie that he had to believe. You want to keep reading? Look at this. Here's the other one, Ran. Last part of verse 10. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life and take it away. He literally is saying, I am the only prophet in the whole land that believes in you. I'm the only faithful one. I'm the only faithful one. And he does it a second time. He tells him again in verse 14, I'm the only one left. And then in verse 15, 16, 17, God tells him all the things he wants him to do. And then in verse 18, here's where it gets kind of unique. And God is still speaking to Elijah. And he says, I will leave 7,000 in Israel all of which that their knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. And you know what? God, let, me, let me put that in the modern day translation for you. Hey, Elijah, there's 7,000 people and prophets right now that you don't even know about. You don't even realize. You don't know. And by the way, Elijah, what about all those prophets that killed the, the Baal worshipers a few days ago? You didn't do that by yourself. I mean, Elijah didn't kill the hundreds of prophets with his own one sword. God used many people in that battle at Mount Carmel to do all of that. You see, you see what happens when you pull into the cave? You have to become the light. You begin to believe false narratives, and you begin to hear all of that stuff. So when God, when you have this meeting place with God, it's in those meeting places that God puts light on your current situation. But there's more than that. In your meeting place, God will clarify current direction too. So let's, let's write that down. In your meeting place, God clarifies direction. You see, on the mountain, clarity came to Elijah. In the cave, you only get the voices. That's all you get. You just get the voices. Did you notice in verses 15, 16, and 17? The first thing he said is, I want you to go back to Damascus in verse 15. 
Then I want you to anoint somebody else. And I want you to anoint this person. And then I want you to anoint that person. And then I want you to anoint that person as a prophet in your place. I want you to anoint Elisha in in verse 16. He clarified his targets. He clarified his direction. Elijah began to sink into himself, and it all got fuzzy, and it all got weird. You see, when you meet with God on a consistent basis, he keeps your directions clear. I love how in a moment where Elijah thought it was all over, that God said, you're far from done, buddy. You're far from done. I got way more for you. I got a new purpose for you, but you don't get that in the cave. You have to go stand on the mountain to get that. You got to make it, you got to make it a want to. There is a filling if you're willing. And if you'll go into that place of meeting, God will fill you. And so he begins to realter all of his work. Because what happens when life gets foggy to us is, is we have different narratives in our head. And I think on that mountain, Elijah saw a whole new plan being laid out for his next step of faithfulness, his, his new calling from God. That's where he got the word. Those narratives matter. But did you notice where he got his current narrative from in the cave? What I'm going through, the people around me, my work life, all of his current situation was driving the narrative. And listen to me. So if you ever feel bad about believing lies, you ever feel bad about self-condemnation, you ever feel bad about getting all foggy and caught up in drama, don't feel too bad. It happened to Elijah. He got caught up in it too. You see, we were never meant to get our significance from our work. We were never meant to get our significance from our possessions, and we were never meant to get our significance from people. But those are the key areas a lot of times that drive how we feel and drive how we look at the world. And those current narratives really change how we look at ourselves. But when you go into the meeting place, those narratives become clear with the narrative so what God did is he, he cleaned out all of that. Because the reason I show you a boat is I can tell you that your current context that you're dealing with, whatever that context may be, or the next time you get into a dark moment of the soul, that context is often just like that sailboat. That context, listen to me really close, okay? I'm telling you, this is going to help you. That your current context when... When you get into those dark places or when you get confused or when you get clouded about things, those, those current storylines tend to blow the wind. And your, your sailboat tends to go where the wind blows, right? You ever felt like you've been caught up in a situation and it's like you're on a train and you can't get off it? You ever feel like something's being manipulated in your family? You ever feel like there's a storyline going on in your head and, and you're, maybe you're sideways with a coworker or you and your daughter, you, you can't really, there's a block there. Or maybe in your marriage, there's, there's, there's this narrative. You see, the enemy is coming after your mind. He's coming after how you interpret life. What the enemy wants to do is he constantly wants to frame up the story you believe. And sometimes we buy into that. And so our current situation, tend to blow wind in the sails and so what happens is when you go to the mountain place when you go to the meeting place when you come out of the dark and into the light the darkness can't speak to it anymore that's why your meeting place matters your meeting places matter. Your walk with God, your personal walk in the word, walking, listening to the Holy Spirit, surrounding yourself with spirit-filled people. Some of, the, some of, the, some of you, the best thing you could do to, to see spiritual freedom happen in your life right now is lovingly and kindly separate yourself from some of these people that are in your ear all the time. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Some of you, the best thing you could do is separate yourself lovingly and kindly from, you know what? I've had enough of like, for like years with you. Some of those people are in your family. 
God's not saying excommunicate him from your life, but I will tell you right now, there's lots of scriptures to support yourself by staying around saints filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Because you will walk and you'll become like the people you live closest to. Get around people that know God. Get on, that, that's a meeting place in and of itself. Listen, man, I got a whole host of people. I'm an only child. I'll make everybody my best friend. Now, I got a whole host of people. When things don't go and I can't figure something out, I'm on the phone, buddy. I'm not kidding. I'll pay for it. I've done it. I will pay for counsel. I'll seek it out. Pastors, we do that with each other. You see, you got to have people that help you understand the narrative. And so what, so what, what, what God did is, is in all of his love, he said, Elijah, get out of that place, man. You're, in, you, you're self-sabotaging. You're getting into that dark spot. Get out of here where I can talk to you. And so Elijah did. See, you're meeting place with God. That's the, it's the birthplace of freedom, man, practically speaking. I think our meeting places are those places where we re-engage with God and he talks to us in a different way. You know, something, I didn't plan on bringing this up, but, and I still haven't figured this out yet, and I, but I don't know if you caught this in reading the story of Elijah. But did you happen to notice that in the earthquake, God wasn't in that. And in the fire, God wasn't in that. But the Bible says right there in verse 13 that when Elijah heard the blowing of the wind, he hid his face. He hadn't seen God yet, but he knew. I think that's interesting. There was something inside of him in that moment that he knew God was about to speak. It said when he heard the gentle blowing, he hid his face. He didn't hide his face in the earthquake. He didn't hide his faith, face in, in all the blowing up. And the, they, there's a big word for that called theophany. It means a spiritual storm and hurricane. None of that shook Elijah. But when, when he heard the gentle blowing, he hid his face. But none of that happened until he was on the mountain. You see, you, you get out on the mountain and things happen. And so I would say to you that there is a filling, if you're willing. Jesus made us a promise in Matthew, come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me, and all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Come to Christ, and I'll speak to your current situation. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter, but sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world is sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.